You know, it's been a long time since I have felt the presence of God so strongly that I'm trembling as I get into the pulpit. And yet, as a being trained originally as a Baptist minister, I was taught, boy, you better tremble every time you get behind the altar. This is a sacred desk, and we do it in the fear of God. We're going to start a new series this morning, and I'm going to be laying precept upon precept and line upon line. So it's going to take us a while to get where we need to get, but you can't get there unless you understand it. And the last couple of weeks, I've just been really moved by God to begin doing some yeshivas. Uh, two weeks ago on Wednesday night, we did one with the men dealing with the great falling away. And one of the things that never really... You know, being raised as a Baptist, I always, always heard, you know, one of these days churches are going to be empty because there's going to be the great falling away. And what we never conceived of is that you had all the entire churches that fell away, so you still had churches full of people. They just fell away because that word to, to fall away is what, in the Greek is where we get the word apostasy from. It means to defect from truth. It's like an American defecting and becoming a Russian. That you, you had people in the kingdom defect back to another kingdom. That's scary. And uh, we, we, ha we can have mega churches today that are filled with nobody really serving Jesus. And so I really enjoyed the one we had with the men, and I've got some disciples across the nation that thanks to Skype, you know, you're able to get there and, and, and us having discussion. One was, one was in Tennessee, one, or two of them were in Tennessee. One was in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And uh, just a wonderful thing to be able to, and one was somewhere, I forgot now. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's just a matter of being able to, to have four or five different people, thanks to technology, you can actually see their expressions, you can see their faces as we begin discussing these things. Minnesota. Uh, and Chad brought up one thing. He began to bring up the bond servant because we were looking not only for the problem, but we were looking for the answer. And he began to bring up the bond servant. And this is something that I taught on. In fact, I wrote a little booklet back around 2002, 2003. And God said, it's time to take it to another level. Because I think the antidote for the poison that has been served the body of Christ that is causing the, the apostasia, the, the, the falling away, is the heart of the bondservant. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to go to Exodus chapter 21. You know, I, especially when it comes to Torah, you know, the first four books, especially of the Bible, are unique over all the other books. Now, how many know that from Genesis to Revelation, they're all anointed of God? The, Bible, the Apostle Paul was very succinct when he said that, that holy men of old wrote as they were, they were moved by the Holy Spirit. But, you know, the first four, he didn't necessarily get moved by the Holy Spirit. Almighty God set up, came to Moses and said, boy, get your pad and pen. I want you to write down what I say. Very unique. And so the placement of things in the Torah... Uh, we've not been learned, we've not, you know, as, as a Baptist minister, I was not taught, I was taught line upon line, but I've never been taught precept upon precept. I've never been taught to look for principles, to look for why did God say what he said, when he said it, and why was it placed in that strategic place in the Bible? I mean, it's very, very powerful. And so we, we have the law of the bondservant here, starting with verse 1. And now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them, if thou buy a Hebrew servant. Six years shall he serve, and in the seventh he shall uh, go uh, free for nothing. In other words, he'll go free and he'll not have to pay anything. Uh, Exodus chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. And if he came by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then, he shall, then his wife shall go out with him. Uh, and if his master have given him a wife, and she has borne him sons and daughters, the wife and children shall stay with the masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if a servant shall plainly say, I love my master. I, boy, I tell you what, slavery must have been different back then than it was what we saw in America. I didn't see, I didn't see any of the black community say, I love my master. They went to war to get free of them. 
How many know God's concept of slavery and man's concept of slavery are two different things or servanthood? But if he shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, and he shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Now, what is so strategic about the passage of the bondservant is that it is right after the Ten Commandments in the previous chapter. How many know that's not by accident? God, I mean, God is so succinct. A lot of times, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm learning because we, we, we tend to take snippets in the, in the Word of God. We take sound bites. That's the way that we are trained in the media and in school. You take sound bites. Let me tell you something. If you take just sound bites from the Word of God, you miss everything. You, you gotta, one of the things I was taught in hermeneutics is like dropping a, a, pe, uh, a pebble into water. As the ripples go out, you better examine all the ripples. You better examine the context. You better examine the situation that it was in. And the strategicness of being right after the Ten Commandments. How many know the Ten Commandments are an, encapsul an encapsulization of all the commandments of God? It's, 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 a, it's a, a snapshot of all the commandments. And there are five toward God, and there are five toward men. Now, you really need to catch this. Because as we're going to see in some things, a bondservant includes all ten. But someone who is not a bondservant will only have an emphasis on the last five. Think about that for a minute. That's one of those, hmm, Sila. <laughs> so the first ten, they're, and they're all relational in nature. The first five are about how to have a relationship with God. The second five are about how to have a relationship with one another. And how many know there were two tablets that Moses had? And there's great debate on the two tablets that God put uh, the first five on one and the second five on the other. And that there's, I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? You know, because you only have so much room on tablets. <laughs> but how many know that God wrote it with his finger, which is the strongest laser that ever was, and he could have wrote the entire Bible on those two pieces of tablet. You just had to get a magnifying glass to be able to read it all. But how many know when nobody does fine print like Almighty God if he wants to? But we also look at the traditions of the kingdoms in the area, and whenever you had a stronger king would come in and, and they would always deliver the people from their current rulership. And they would come in, and one of the things the king would do, and it was always a covenant of love supposed to be expressed toward the people, and he would write in a capsulization of how to walk in that kingdom, and, they would, and he wanted it to be permanent so it would be upon stone. But there were always two sets made. One was to always be before that vassal nation, where the, wherever the leadership or the head of that vassal nation was. The other, the king always kept before his throne, wherever his throne was, so that they were both following the same sheet of music, if you will. And you say, well, why did the children of Israel keep them both? Because the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, is God's throne upon the earth. Therefore, he put both sets, which were identical, into his throne. That's why they were in the Ark of the Covenant. Now, in the Ten Commandments, God was saying that you are now free of the house of Pharaoh. He brought them after. He, he didn't give them to them while they were in Egypt. He gave them to them after, he came to Mount, after they came to Mount Sinai. He said, now that you're free from the house of Pharaoh, here are some basic reminders of how you walk in my house. Understanding the houses are important because houses represent kingdoms. God was saying, you are free to walk in my house. That, that Hebrew word that we translate servant or bondservant is abed in Hebrew. Now, according to Gesenius and Brown Drivers Briggs, it means slave, it means servant. A manservant subjects Worshippers of God. So that same word translated servant means someone who worships God. A servant in a special sense is a prophet, a Levite, a servant of Israel. So that the same word servanthood, see all of Israel were known as the servants of God. They were supposed to serve God in the earth. But I like it when you take apart the Hebrew, that 
word is made up of three Hebrew characters, ayin, bet, and dalit. Ayin, I, bet, house, and dalit, door. In other words, a true servant always keeps his eye on his master's door because that's where he gets his instructions from. Now, why is that so important? Why is this thing about house so important? What's the very first letter in the Hebrew Bible? The very first word in the beginning is bereshit. And one of the, one of the things the rabbis have argued is, is why did not God start with Aleph? Because Aleph represents the oneness of God. Hero Israel, O Lord our God, the Lord is one. Why didn't he start with one? Why did he start with bet? Bet means house. Because in the beginning when God created, he wanted to create a house. It was the house of God. And another stuck it, snuck in and soul, soul, or stole his servant children out of his house through the sin of treason because they decided to serve another. So it's all, everything from Genesis to Revelation is about whose house is it, whose servants are in that house, and what master they serve. Now, you can say, well, I'm free in Christ. My Bible says you were bought with a price. If you buy a Hebrew servant, if you buy one that allows him to cross over to serve, we were bought with the price of the cross. We were bought. And we're brought into the household of God, and the only way that you're ever going to grow as a believer is you've got to learn to become a servant of God. A servant. And now there's a difference between servant and bond servant. We saw that you, go, you can only get the bond servant when you have gone seven years. What, what does that mean? Now, seven it represents completeness, spiritual, and perfection or maturity. It represents the process of maturing in the master's house. And we, we've got probably two or three sessions we're going to do on that because we've never been taught to be faithful to his house. We've been taught a lot of other things. We need to understand that we come in by a blood covenant, don't we? It's a blood covenant. Now, here a few years back when I taught growing in grace, one of the interesting observations that God gave me, there are four types of covenant in the word. Four types. Now, there's, I mean, there's, there's more than one blood covenant. There's more than one covenant in the word. But there's four basic types. Blood covenant, salt covenant, a sandal covenant, and a marriage covenant. Now, what's really interesting is you begin to find out what those covenants mean when you compare them to the four cups of the Passover. And there's also four types of baptism in the Word of God. And so if you group them together and you kind of go to see which ones, the blood covenant also goes to the first cup of Passover, which is the, covenant, which is the cup of servanthood. How do you get to servanthood by that blood covenant? Well, you've got to go to the first baptism, which is a baptism of repentance. Isn't that what you're supposed to do when you because you have repented? It's a believer's baptism because I have repented and I have come into blood covenant by the blood of Jesus. That repentance is manifested by my publicly being baptized before men saying that I, I identify with him in the grave, in his death, and in his resurrection. And now I walk in newness of life. But you know, you know me, you got to grow past that. You got to grow past that because there's the second covenant. The second covenant is a salt covenant, and it is a covenant of friendship. And so if you had two men in the ancient world that came together and they became fast friends, and they said, listen, I, I want our households to walk together. And they would carry a bag of salt with them. And they, and I mean, back then, salt was actually worth something. You know, it's not like today you go to Walmart and you get one for 98 cents. Salt was a precious commodity, so much so that Roman soldiers in the time of Jesus would rather be paid in salt than gold. How many know now gold is better, but that's here, not here or there. Um, you know, if I'm going to say I'm going to give you a month's wages and I hand you a little thing of Morton salt, you're not going to get very excited. 
I hand you that size in gold, you can get really excited. But they, they would take that salt and they would, they would put some of their salt in each other's bag and shake it up and say, the only way that this covenant could ever be broken is by us going back into our bags and pulling out the original grains of salt. And it was a friendship covenant. My house now stands with your house. Somebody attacks you, they attack me. Somebody blesses you, they bless me. And the second cup of the Passover is the friendship cup. And then the second type of baptism is a baptism of dedication, that they become dedicated to one another. We, we can see, I mean, we, we, you can see this through the Gospels. Jesus was, they, they, they came as servants of God, but he says, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. It was a salt covenant. Because they were dedicated to the Messiah. Let me tell you something, whenever you are dedicated toward God, God will reciprocate with the same level of dedication toward you that you do to him in a manifested way. How many know God's dedication toward us is beyond what we can say, you know, we can understand, but yet in this realm, in this earth realm, there will be a manifestation of his dedication to us to the same proportion that we dedicate ourselves to him. The third one is the sandal covenant. And a sandal covenant represents, also is represented by the sec, a third cup in the Passover, which is the cup of inheritance. In fact, in the Torah, you would find that men would set the, the boundary of their property by their old shoes. And it's a curse to move a landmark because you're moving somebody's inheritance. And when Jesus took off their sandals, when he washed their feet, he was saying for these 12, you have went from servant to friend to where you're getting ready to get your inheritance in the kingdom. And so the third baptism is called the baptism of ministry. Now, we have a lot of guys in the pulpit. We have a lot of men and women that minister from the pulpit, but not a lot of them do ministry because they've never gotten to this level. They've never been baptized into ministry. That is not something that we can have a ceremony, if you will. And, and you know, I always jokingly say, you know, I come from the three bubble Baptists. You hold them down to the third bubble comes up, or at least you know they've repented before you let them up. Uh, but there, there, see, this baptism is not a, a baptism you can do with water. Th this is a baptism that you are baptized in ministry that because you have, you have that covenant, that inheritance has been released in you that the ministry of Jesus begins to flow through you. And what's really interesting when you go down, this is the ultimate covenant. You know there's a covenant higher than blood covenant? More precious? It's the fourth covenant. The fourth covenant is marriage covenant. And what's interesting is the fourth cup in, in the Passover set is a cup of marriage. It was that one that Jesus held up and, and, and drank from and said, I'll not drink of this from you again until I drank from it. When we come into the kingdom, why? It's going to be called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And in fact, the fourth baptism is marriage. You think God's trying to prove a point? Marriage, marriage, marriage. The only antidote for the Laodicean church when Jesus stood at the door knocking on the outside, it was to start the betrothal process. We, we don't understand this because we don't understand our Hebraic heritage. In that day and in that era, when, let's say Mary and I were, were kids and we decided, well, we'd like to get married, I would come with my dad. In fact, my dad would already have talked to her dad and had an appointed time. He and I would come and knock at her door. And her dad would look at her and say, you really want this joker? Yeah, Dad. Well, let's open the door because now they're going to come in and have fellowship with us. And, I'm, and, and so the, 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 the son stands with his father and says, here's all the things I'm doing to prepare a place for her. Here's, a, here's what I am called to do. This, this is going to be my purpose in the universe. And let me know for Jesus, that's, I am called to be a Jewish king. I am called to sit on the throne of David. I am called that one day I will come and I will rule and reign forever in a Jewish court. Laid it all out. I mean, we get snippets as, behold, I go and prepare a place for you. 
And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back for you again. That's actually part of the, this whole process. I'm going to go prepare a place. Well, when are we going to get married? When I get it done. Okay. But we stop there by saying, glory to God, Jesus is preparing a place for me. Not only took him six years to do the universe, and he's been working on this thing for 2,000 years. Woohoo! You know, how, how great can it be? But we, we forget that it doesn't stop there. After he gets through saying, here is who I am. Here is what I'm called to do. Here is what I, this is what I'm, I'm placing on the table. Then the whole family looks at the girl and says, okay, now what does she need to learn and what does she need to change to come in line with you? Uh-oh. Because we have spent the last 2,000 years trying to bring Jesus in line with us instead of us coming in line with Jesus. We have changed our theologies. We have changed the way that we do everything to try. We're, we're, and what we, we don't know is we're actually creating another Jesus because since he is almighty God, he's unchangeable. The moment you move away from him, you have moved away from him. I know that's deep. Because it's my task as the bride to learn how to walk with a king who is going to sit on the throne of David. How do you conduct yourself when you live from Jerusalem? And see, that was the antidote to the Laodicean church. Quit trying to do everything yourself. The only antidote for worldliness and this lukewarmness is begin entering into that betrothal. How many know, how many know the moment that a girl gets engaged, the whole universe changes? It's all about the marriage. It's all about the wedding. It's all about, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. That, I mean, she'll become fixated. You can, you can take her anywhere to go shopping, and it's all about the wedding, and this will look good here, and this will look good here, and this is what I need here, and i got to put this in my hope chest. Do you know why, you know why that's instinctually the way that is within a woman? It's because it's an example to the church about the way we should be about Jesus. After we get saved and we, we get to maturing a little bit, man, it's all about the wedding. I, got, I better had come in line with him. I'm not asking him to change. He walked into this process and stood before me and said, I'm called to be king. You want to marry me? Then you better learn how to walk with the king. Guys, we all start as servants that have been bought. But after that seven-year process or the, what's represented in that seven of maturing to where you're completely free, well, huh? you can't become a bond servant until you're free. Oh, see, law. You can't become a bond servant until you're free of your past, to where you're completely free not only of the house of Pharaoh, but you've learned how to function in the house that you're now in. And once you're free, you're supposed to end up as a bond servant. You run back to the master. In other words, you're a servant because of love. I love my master. I refuse to leave my master. Now, there are, very, there are two very powerful bond servants that we see in the Word of God. Let's go to Revelation chapter 15 and verse 3. And if you don't know precepts, you actually kind of miss over what is being said here in Revelation 15. These are not contrasting statements. They, uh, they complement each other. And they sang the song of Moses, the what of God? The servant of God, the bond servant of God. And the song of the Lamb. If they complement each other, then Jesus is a servant too. Come on now. That's why Jesus said, I have come to do the will of him who sent me. Now I want you to just think about that for a moment, and I want to go to Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 5. Oh, I'm preparing to mess this morning. I'm going to mess you up. 
in Jesus' name. Because sometimes you, get, you need to get messed up before you get straightened up. Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you. Let this mind be in you. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and upon himself took the form of a servant. Let this mind be in you, the mind of a servant. Let this mind be in you, even though he was almighty God come in the flesh, but for your sake, he showed himself to be a servant so that you could get it. So that you could understand. He came in the earth as a free man, but as soon as as he was of the age of accountability, we find him in the temple being about his father's business. Because not only did he have a bar mitzvah, but he took his ear and nailed it to the door of his father's house. Oh. You know what that means? I'm only going to listen to you. I'm only going to listen to you. Only to you, Father. That's why he said that I will not say a word unless I first hear my father stand in the door of heaven and say it. I will not do a thing unless I look and I behold and my father stands in the door and he's doing it. Because as a servant, my eye is on the door of my father's house. We do so much, guys, in ministry and none, none of it ever lines up with the door of our Father's house. It lines up with what everybody else is doing that appears to be successful. I posted to our blog this week. It was, it was the first Baptist church of Orlando that put this together, but I thought it was, this, it was so good on contemporary worship or contemporary church. And, they, and it's, it's, it's like there's the same motion they go through, and it's just like add whatever you want to add here. And you have a guy come out, and he's wearing glasses, and he welcomes everybody, and he says, and, I'm just, and I just welcome everyone so that you can see the tattoo on his arm so that he knows he'd have a past. And, and then they, and it, it, it's, it, you guys need to go in and watch it because it, you, you, if you look at modern church, it follows the same pattern. It's not a pattern of heaven. It's a pattern of the emergent church. Which, they're, in other words, they're drawing, they're emerging away from the church and becoming something else. And it, it's almost hilarious when you watch it because you, ah. And the, the graduate that I had sent it to me, she was going to an Assembly of God church that for a while they had moved into the gymnasium to hold church because they were remodeling the sanctuary. And the entire church was aghast when they walked in and all the walls were painted black coffee house kind of set up like the emergent church. Spent over $10,000 in laser lights and uh, fog machines. Let me tell you something. When the Chabod of God comes in, his glory comes in, you don't need to have a fog machine. <laughs> Come on. You don't need to have a light show. I need for the light to show. And Watered down gospel, watered down everything because you want to make visitors to feel comfortable. I don't. I want the Holy Ghost to feel comfortable. If you got sin in your life, I want you to be like a cat on a hot tin roof. I want you to have to grab your seat to keep from running out of this place screaming because your sin convicts you. We have stopped being servants and we've become something else. It said he took on the farm, a servant was made into the likeness of men, being found in the fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient. He humbled himself and became obedient. Right there, you need to write on the margin, help me, Jesus. He humbled himself and became obedient to what? The point of death. To the point of crucifixion. Do you know when you've learned to be a servant of God is when your flesh wants to do one thing and God says to do another and your response is crucifying the flesh. 
It's like I shared here a couple weeks ago. God has us on this journey, and, we, and we, we couldn't understand why the angels were passing out nails and hammers on the journey. You know, you figured they'd be, you know, if it's a marathon race, they'd be handing out Gatorade and, and uh, power bars, but they keep on handing you nails and hammers because they expect some crucifixion along the way so that you can make the run. Jesus is the example. Now it says, Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things underneath the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It was because he humbled himself that he was empowered to save your soul. Let me tell you something, when we learn to humble ourselves to be a servant to God is when that salvation can really take a hold. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. I'm building a foundation this morning. You see, we have been lied to in the church that Moses and Jesus are opposed to one another. Guys, they're Twinkies. You know what, you know, they dress alike. When, when Moses was talking about Hamashiach coming, he said, you're going to know him because he's going to be just like me. They were both servants. Moses gave the Torah. Jesus gave the power to live the Torah. Now, I want you to look at this comparison by the writer of Hebrews, which I believe was the Apostle Paul. Hebrews chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him that appointed him. What is that? Servant. He was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch for he hath built the house, hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that buildeth all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the, con the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. Notice, it's house, it's house, being faithful in the house. One of the things that is plaguing Christianity today is there is no faithfulness to God's house. I'm not, I'm not just talking about this local fellowship. I know this, this is God's house, but you know, you're God's house. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. But in the broader spectrum of things, there's only two houses in the planet. The house of Pharaoh, the house of Adonai. Just two houses. Because it's represented by two kingdoms. The kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of light. Only two houses. You're either completely in the one or you're in the other. Let me tell you something. There are some people convinced they can have one foot in one kingdom, one foot in the other kingdom, and I'll give a, prophet, I'll give a prophetic word to you today that God's going to see to it that you come against a tall, hard fence post because it's time for you to get out of the valley of decision, either serve one or serve the other. I want to be like Elijah this morning. Either Baal is Lord and serve him or God is Lord and you serve him. Get off the fence. Because only that which is holy in God's kingdom will God protect. Now, I want us to understand that we all serve something. It is encoded into our DNA spiritually. The number one search that man has is not a search for riches. Do you know that? It's a search for significance. Why am I here? Who am I? You are here because God created you to serve in his house, the earth. And you're never going to get any true self-worth until you find out a wor your worth as a servant of God. Guys, whether man calls it, you know, calling to a higher purpose, finding his place in the universe, it's in the base code 
to find out who we serve. And there's only three that you can serve, just three. Number one, you can serve God. I mean, really serve God. I'm not talking about lip service because God over and over again in the Old Testament and it's reflected in the New Testament and manifested in the church today, they are close with me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. God's talking about more than lip service. He's talking about heart service. We can serve God. Choice number two, you can serve self. Now, Serving self is a deception because it's actually serving darkness indirectly. Or you can serve darkness. Only three choices. Only one gets to heaven. And did you know that the way to tell who you serve is by how you keep the Ten Commandments? There's a code in this. That's why it's directly connected to the bond servant. Because... One who serves God follows all Ten Commandments. That he is the Lord God who got us out of the Pharaoh's house. I'll serve no other. I'll have no other gods before him. Come on. The Sabbath is a part of your service to God. Because the day that you say is the Sabbath identifies the God that you serve. Did you know the witches have a Sabbath? It's Thursday. Muslims have a Sabbath. It's Friday. God has a Sabbath. It's Saturday. Christians have a Sabbath, which is the Roman Sunday. And so, well, we can rewrite the first five because, y y you know, there's grace. Now, you better keep the second five. Why? Because preservation of self. Think about that for a minute. Christians don't give more thought about the first five than the man on the moon. They don't. But them second five, now that, now that includes how you treat me, so we better give some significance to that. At the same time, they'll fudge on it if it conflicts with their own self-interest. When you serve self, it's easy to commit adultery. When you serve self, it's easy to commit false witness. When it's easy to steal and to kill when you're serving self. Those who serve darkness actually dedicate themselves to trying to break all ten every day. Do you know that? Those who follow like the first church of Satan or, or follow into the occult work hard to violate as many of the commandments as they can every day. Well, if they're working that hard to break them, maybe, you know what, we ought to put some effort into keeping them. Just, just, just a question. And I can, I can tell you, because now I have talked to ministers that fell. And you know, how, what, you know what's one of the things on the signpost they say? I don't believe in the Ten Commandments anymore. I not only believe in the 10, but I believe in the 613 that are in Torah that were codified by Moshe Mamamides during the Middle Ages. He actually, the family actually broke them down. And now not all of them apply to me. I'm not a Kohen. I'm not a Levite. I'm not, I'm not living in Israel. But how I many know there are many things for anybody walking in the kingdom that they apply? This, this is the rules of the master's house. Well, God wouldn't want me to follow 613. There's over 1,000 in the New Testament. Over a thousand. Most of them are expressions of the 613 in the old. But we have Christians. You know what we are? We, we're, we're people. Have you ever noticed? In America, when we were liberated in the Revolutionary War from Great Britain, it was un we, we were liberated from tyranny that we did so because we were such a moral people that we fought for the right to be moral and to be righteous. It's the whole purpose of the Revolutionary War. And because of that, things were done in dignity, they were done in order, and that our nation tried to move forward. But we're looking at places that they're trying to bring democracy now. How many know it's chaos in the streets? Because they're not moral, it did not start out with morality. 
It did not start out with righteousness. It did not start out looking to the Creator to find out what not only what unalienable rights that we had, but what responsibilities we had to Him. And so they can't handle democracy. They're running around like a bunch of chickens with their heads cut off, killing anything and everything. They have to have military rule. And, I mean, there's a bunch our media doesn't show us. When they were celebrating, when, when Egypt fell and they were celebrating, we had female U.S. reporters that were being raped during that celebration right on the square. Where was the cameraman? One of them was CBS News, and CBS wouldn't even cover her rape. She had to go to, I think it was Fox or one of the other more conservative networks to, to say, this is what's really happening there. Well, how can that be? It's happening in the church of God today. We were set free by Jesus, but because we didn't identify with the morality of the kingdom, I'm free to do anything I want to do. No, you're not. Paul says, should sin abound, that grace should much more abound? God forbid. I was set free so that I could live righteously. I was set free from the house of bondage so that I could learn to be free from that house of bondage and the way they think, the way they act, the way they do, so I can start learning how my, ma my new master acts, so I can function in his house, and I can grow to the place that I can walk freely because no matter how you push me, no matter how the devil tries to poke me, he ends up hearing about Jesus. He ends up with a response of the word, not of the flesh like the way it used to be in Egypt. But now when the devil comes at me, it's word, it's word. Watchman, he said this, this very powerful statement in his book, The Ministry of the Word. He said, with Jesus, it was the word made flesh. And now the task of the Christian is to make the flesh the word. Because only a free man can come up and say, I choose to be your bondservant. Only a free man, one who has learned, well, we're, we're going to get into last, but one who has learned how to act right in the master's house, how to function under the master's authority, how to understand what the master wants, what, what, what his, his ways are. You know, God could couldn't give a flying leap about your ways like they matter in the universe. Did you ever see God come down anywhere Old and New Testament and say, boys, what do you think? How should I do this? <laughs> Why don't you tell me what's right and wrong, you know, because, because it's situational. There, there is no absolutes. God came down. He said, you know what? I'm the absolute creator of the heaven and earth. Nobody done it by me. There ain't nobody like me. And this is my absolutes of how to live. If you violate it, we call it sin. And how many know it is sin today? It was sin before the cross. It's sin after the cross. It will always be sin. Absolute. Because we serve an absolute righteous and holy God. In him is no shadow of darkness. There's no turning in almighty God. And so as a servant in this maturing process, I've got, to, I've got to unlearn what Pharaoh taught me, and I've got to learn the way of my master. And when I have perfected in that, when I am complete in that, when I have matured in that, I am now free from that. I'm free from darkness. I'm free from the old way. And when I'm in free, now I can run to my master and say, put my ear on your doorpost. Only a free man can do that. Only a mature man can do that. Only someone who is whole can do that. And we have not even started the disciplinary process of learning how to function in our master's house because we're running amok thinking now that we're in his house, we can do whatever we want to do because he loved us. And then Jesus stands in the doorway of his house and says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Can you see how we've bought the lie of the Pharaoh? You can go ahead and act like you're in Egypt and do it in his house. You can go ahead and make golden calves. You go ahead and you do this. You can go ahead and you do that. That's the way they used to do it in Egypt. And some of that stuff you liked. Your flesh did. 
you didn't like the beatings that you got, but you like some of the other stuff because that's where you thought was power. And God is kadosh. He is holy, which means he is the absolute other. He's completely different than Egypt. He is other. And now God says, I want you to be holy as I am holy. In other words, he says, I want you to be other as I'm other. I want you to be so unlike the world that you stick out like a blessed thumb. Uh, when the whole world's going left, you're going right. The church, because we're still tied to Egypt, we're worried about what Egypt thinks. We're worried about being relevant to Egypt. Got to dress like them. You know, the, if, if, I, if this was an emergent shirt, I'd be wearing a, a T-shirt with some kind of goth imprinted logo or something on it. How many know that when you're walking with Christ, you shouldn't look like something that was worn during dark shadows? Come on. I don't serve Fangor. <laughs> the beast. That's what the world is enamored with. Pagans tattoo themselves. Why are Christians? In fact, tattooists themselves, and I've got, I've got direct quotes in my library, that they said it used to be whenever Christianity would move into pagan areas, they would abolish any tattooing. They would abolish that practice because they knew it was pagan. How pagan is it? Here's a commandment from God. Thou shalt not tattoo thyself. I am the Lord God. You know what? That, that's, you underline that, you exclamate it, and you put special effects behind it. Every time you read that, the word lightning should go off in thunder. Because that's what happened when they gave the Ten Commandments. They gave the Ten Commandments. The mountain shook. God showed out. They all feared God. He said, this so that you didn't get it. Don't create golden graven images. Now let's talk about the bond servant. I love that sequence. Here's my commandments. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. Now you shake it up. You got it. I'm God. You're not. I took Pharaoh down, didn't even break a sweat. Don't you go and do what they used to do and calling it service unto me. The first time he told them that, Moses went up for 40 days. He comes back and there's a golden calf. 40 days. How I many know it didn't take God 40 days to write the Ten Commandments in stone? It took him 40 seconds. You know why he did it? It was a test. This is a test of God's emergency broadcasting system. I'm going to see what happens when you think there are no consequences for acting like you're back in Egypt. And I'm going to let it go so far, but I'm going to have a man come down full of the glory of God that's going to hold the commandments in his hands. And you better find out which side you're on because the earth is hungry that day. Who will stand with God? And I mean, I mean they, they were blatantly pagan. The Bible said, the King James is so poetic, and they went forth to play. Adult play. It's called orgy. And there, they said this golden calf, this is Yahweh Elohim that brought us out of Egypt. How many golden calves have we made in the church that we said, this is now the Jesus who saved us? Not Jewish. He's from Detroit. He was from the hills of Tennessee. He was totally American. He'd feel fine having barbecue pork chops. Probably had a tattoo so that everybody could see he had a past. How many he did have a past that was called glory? How far have... Guys, I stand with the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians. Who has bewitched you to believe another gospel? Who's bewitched us? We have lost servanthood completely. We think it's our house. So much so, 
that most churches, they vote on what they want to do. As being raised a Baptist minister, I was always taught that the will of God can only be overturned by two-thirds majority vote, which was done most of the time because everybody was interested in what they wanted. I want this preacher because he's friendly. He comes and pets my little head. And all I got to do is stick out a boo-boo lip, and he'll change everything in the church just to keep that boo-boo lip sucked in. Because you know if you get five, six, seven sheep of boo-boo lips, we're going to vote that sucker out. Run him out on a rail. And then you get mad when you end up with a hireling. who takes you down the beaten path of the flesh. It's all right. Come on now. Jesus loves the sinner, so when you sin, he really loves you. Forgetting the apostle Paul said, God forbid. It's not our house. It's his house. Now, I'll be real blunt here about biblical life. You guys have one vote, and you do it by coming. And you do it again by leaving and never coming back. Because this is a place of truth. Let me tell you something. God corrects me. Lord have mercy. God corrects me. And if I don't get it the first time, Mary will remind me and help me learn it the second time. You, you, don't, you don't marry a prophetess and, and try to fudge just a little bit because... There, there's, you know, there's always a spoon in the fudge, and that's what she uses to whack me with. Thank God. And then a lot of times you know, we balance each other up because if she knows the direction, I have an apostolic anointing to establish directions. But you know what that also means? That also means I don't, I don't get away with anything. Thank God because my flesh sometimes likes to get away with some stuff. And I know I can't do it and live with the woman I'm living with. And since I'm madly in love with her, I'm just going to straighten up, fly right. But both of us have learned this is his house. That's why even before church starts, we're already trying to find the groove that God wants to flow today. And so you, you can't figure out and do PowerPoint before that. You know, it's, it's songs, if you don't know, hold around long enough, you will know. And if you know, a couple of times we changed courses with Pastor Rodhouse saying, no, go this way. Let's sing this song. Why? It's because it, God is prophetically speaking. This is the direction God wants to go because it's not about pleasing your flesh. It's about healing your soul and healing your spirit and, and coming into, into his presence because God has you on a journey to perfection so that you can be a bondservant. Mm. So in the process that we're going to do, guys, and how many know it's very Hebraic to ask questions? Remember when Jesus was being examined by the Sanhedrin and they asked him a question and he responded with a question? Did you know that was culturally proper? That's actually the way it was done because in asking the questions, you get to the right question. And if you could ever ask the right question, you can finally hear the answer. How many of us have been trying to give the answer to people that aren't asking questions? You're throwing pearl before swine. And so when they struck Jesus, his response was, then how can we have a discussion? I thought you'd come here to talk. <laughs> you brought me up here to talk, might as well talk. No, you're not going to talk. We've already decided what we're going to do. So Hebraically, we're going to begin asking a lot of questions because the Word of God is written to get you to ask questions because if you ask the right questions, the Word can give you the right answers. But you cannot see them. The Word of God is spiritual. It's living. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, able to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart, able to cut between the marrow and the bone. How many know that's deep and that's accurate? But the only way it can do that is God's got to work on you to ask the right question because if you can ask the right question, you're finally ready for the answer. So I'm going to be asking a lot of questions as we do this. This week has a question. Who are you serving? 
some of those some of the most important questions that you'll ever ask yourself is who are you who do you serve who do you trust Do you trust the, the guy with the biggest church or do you trust the guy who has had his ear nailed to the doorpost of God's house? Because sometimes he's in the smallest church because nobody wants to hear what he has to say. Did you know that if we had everybody in the last five years that passed through, this, through these doors, this building could not hold them? Couldn't hold them. Because they all came in with their own agendas. You know, for some I'm too Jewish, for some I'm not Jewish enough, and some people are just trying to figure out what I is. Some because I do use PowerPoint, I use computers, you know, and I, I use things like electricity, that can't come here either. Well, I'm not willing to give up electricity until it's taken away. I kind of like it. I kind of like heating. You know, the, the lights that are on really make it easy for you guys to see the Bible. <laughs> and if, if I've got something that I need to show you, I've got PowerPoint. I mean, no DVD is helpful. This stuff goes out thanks to, you, thanks to YouTube, free, all over the place except for China. China won't let it in. We're praying that they're going to change that in Jesus' name. Who are you serving? We need to take a hard look at this morning, who are we really serving? And 99% of Christians, we need to answer, I am guilty of serving self. I'm guilty of serving self because I go to the church that sings the songs I like. I go to the church that the pastor does what I like. He's friendly the way that I want him to be friendly. He preaches the things I like to hear. How many know what you like to hear and what you need to hear many times are two completely different things? I'm tired of hearing that God's answer to everything is write a check. Now, how many know that you need to fund the gospel? But you know, the, the real reason why you give to fund the gospel is to get the true word out, not so that you'll become a millionaire. I do not see any word, thus saith the Lord God, I shall make thee a millionaire to prove that I am in the earth. There are riches in this world that money can't buy. We just had one of the richest men in the world die of pancreatic cancer. How many know that all his wealth didn't take care of it? But... What's, what's worth more than a billion dollars? When you can fall on your knees before Jesus and say, by your stripes, I am healed. And God heals your body. You don't need insurance. You don't need health care. You need Jesus care. Money can't buy that. Or when the enemy comes in like a flood, he raises up a standard against him. I think sometimes we put the comma in the wrong place. I think the flood not refers to the enemy, but the standard that comes up to stop him. You can't buy that. You can't buy to be free of deception. In fact, wealth, if you trust in it, will deceive you. It'll deceive you. The deceitfulness of riches. Hmm, why? Because riches can mask spirituality. That's what the Laodicean church did. But let me show you. Let me, let me show you that we walk with God. Have you seen my, my Mercedes mule? Have you seen our facilities? You can see our facilities 30 seconds or less. Because it really don't matter. Now, it may take you hours to hear everything that needs to be taught because that's where the wealth of the kingdom is. Because who are we serving? If I'm serving the flesh, I want you to be impressed with us. Because if you're impressed with us, you're going to come and put your money where you think it is impressed because now you can say, we're somebody, I'm a part of that. Have you seen our building? Have you seen our jets? Have you seen whatever? Have you seen that? Have you seen our programs? 
We got one program. It's called flowing in the kingdom. That's it. That's it. Well, don't you have babies sitting? How many know babies need to hear the word? We got, we got kids that were raised in this church that don't know nothing but the presence of God and the preaching of the word. They know when, they know when to say that's right and when to hush up and listen. Listen. Why? Because when you train up a child in the way he should go, when he's old, he'll not depart from it. So we're having kids that are not departing from children's church and romper room when they're old. They're still thinking that in church you ought to be given coffee and cookies to keep you happy during the presentation. And it's all about them and keeping them quiet and hushed up because that's the way they were raised. Oh, that was not in my notes. <laughs> but let's be realistic. One of the reasons I love preaching so much is because I remember waking up under a mini pew. I slept as a little kid under the pews. I remember to this day when I was little, Eli and Nathan's age, I would go and I would stand at the back door with the pastor Traditional Baptist church, you know, one of the reasons your eyes are closed and every head is bowed is nobody can see him walk to the back of the church so that he magically appears when everybody opens their eyes, you know. And uh, I would always be back there standing with him, little, little guy. Well, why do you want to be? I want to be a preacher when I grow up. Why? That's, that's what I heard that's what I was used to you don't get that in children's church you don't get that in 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 daddy daycare whatever it is going on that we call they they need to be with the saints and learn to reverence God they need to have respect for the word they need to learn the songs of the saints father Abraham only goes so far There comes a time when they need, to, they need to learn all hail the power of Jesus' name. Right. Let angels prostrate fall. Right. They need to learn there's power in the blood. Yes. You know that you're making a difference when the kids are raised in the right house that when they're out playing, they, they start singing, how great is our God. Come on. Who do we serve? If we serve, if we serve God, then my eyes are on the door of my master's house. You see, my eyes aren't on the front door of this house because I don't care if you come or go. I'm, I'm just going to be truthful. I don't care. I mean, I love everybody. I want to see you grow in God. But whether you come or go is not going to determine how I preach. I have determined to keep, and, and guys, this, I mean, this, I, I've preached a lot of people out of here. <laughs> Mary, when I, when, I, when I was pastoring a traditional church years ago, half of them were charismatic, half of them were Baptist, and half of them were afraid the other side was going to win. Literally. The minute you had an altar call, half of them are saying, don't let anybody speak in tongues. And they go down, the other half was saying, oh, Lord, let them get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I mean, you can feel the conflict. <laughs> and I'd get up there, and, I'd, and, I, and I'm nothing like, I mean, now I, I, I preach a lot harder than I did back then. But my poor wife, she'd go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hear about it all week. Oh, Lord, he's made them all mad, and we're going to go hungry. <laughs> I envy the, I feel sorry for the traditional pastor. He moves, the only time he really ever preaches, well, I saw this really neat cartoon. It was the pastor's last sermon. And outside, you, you see the cartoon, and you see there's a window on the outside, and it has the moving van, and his wife has the van going, and he's finishing up his sermon. He said, all these years, I've got a few things I'd like to say. <laughs> And then as every head is bowed, every eye is closed, he's never seen again. <laughs> that, it's a shame that it's got to be done that way instead of 
Is there, there's enough old Baptists in me, the old Baptists, that when a guy got up, if he didn't stomp on your toes, wallow your flesh, and try to crucify something during the sermon, the man wasn't worth the salt. Now we hire him based upon how much flesh he pets on and pleases and says, it's going to be all right. No, it's not. It's not going to be all right unless it's crucified, unless you're, who, who are you serving in all this? You say you've been bought with a price so that you can run amok in the house and do whatever you want, or is it that you've been bought with a price and now you're learning to serve a new master with at least the same tenacity that you used to serve sin? Oh. We need to enter into the cycle of servanthood in the master's house. Because unless you do, unless you enter in with the right attitude, you're never going to be whole. You're never going to be free. Pharaoh will sneak up on you. The flesh will sneak up on you. Darkness will creep in like the setting of the sun. But as you go through these cycles of God teaching you, and training you everything about the kingdom, everything about the commandments, statutes, and judgments of God, everything about the feasts of God are cycles of sanctification to bring you more in line with the word. Each year, you, you're tossing off more of Egypt out of your pockets, and you're learning how to walk with the master. Because you, when, when, you see, the, the thing is, how many know the master's free? You know, do you know what free really means? You're free from the influence of darkness. That's free. And at the end of that, of, that, of that perfection period, you're just like the master that you can look Satan in the eye and say, you have nothing in me. Nothing. Nothing that you can use to manipulate, control, try to, to get me to do the wrong thing. You have nothing in me because I've become like Jesus and now that I'm like him, I've run to him. I was finally free to run to him. I was finally free to run to him. And you see, I'm running to the one in the book of Revelation. Uh, I, wish, I wish I had darker skin this morning. I probably do this justice. How many know our black brothers and sisters, they can preach a whole lot better? So I feel handicapped this morning. I tell, I tell whenever I preach at a black church, I say, you must forgive me and give me the white handicap. Because I'm handicapped. Just give me just a little space because they could do it so much better. But I'm running. I'm running toward the one whose eyes are a flame of fire. I'm running to the one that his hair is filled with the glory of God to the place that it is white as snow and he is dressed with a golden girdle and that when he speaks that it sounds like the rushing of many waters. That's the Jesus when I'm free, I can run to. But when I'm in bondage, I just want to run to the suffering servant. First time Jesus came, Messiah ben Joseph, the suffering servant. Second time he comes, he's coming as Messiah ben David, the conquering king. Here's a thought, just maybe a thought. Maybe what we call the rapture is when the remnant becomes so much like him, they run to him. It's not a, an escape hatch to get us out of here before we get our head beat in. We have become so much like who he really is. The world can't hold us. And he says, come up hither because I'm getting ready to womp anything that doesn't look like me. The stand back, Watch. Have you read the book of Revelation and what we do? When God is judging the earth and his wrath is being poured on the earth, we're up there saying, great and holy and awesome and true are you in all your ways. They got their comeuppance because they deserved what they got. Because they resisted your grace for too long. Grace, write this down, guys. Grace is not the power to sin. Grace is the power not to. 
grace is the power not to sin. So when people say you can do whatever you want to do because of grace, they don't know what they're talking about. I can now not act like Pharaoh and start acting like Jesus because of grace. That grace enables me to conquer sin, not play with it and entertain it, but put it underfoot where it belongs. And you can do that when you serve the one. Who that when the apostle John, the one who when, when he was in the flesh, leaned on his chest during the Last Supper and heard the heartbeat of God. But when he finally saw him as he is, the Bible says he fell as a dead man. That's the one that we're to have our eye on the door of his house. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is altogether righteous. There is none like him in all the earth. There is none like him in all the universe. And only he has been found worthy to loosen the seals that are on the scroll. Only he has been found worthy to tread out the wrath of God upon the earth. Only him. And if I am entering into that covenant with him, I am preparing to walk with him. So I got to ask you this morning, who are you serving? Have you been serving another Jesus that this says, oh, it's okay. Or are you serving a Jesus that says, be thou holy as I am holy. You've been washed in my blood. You've been cleansed by my sacrifice. You have been filled with my spirit so that you can walk like me. Why aren't you walking like me? I tell you what began to expunge sin out of my life is when I understood covenant and I began to understand who Jesus really is. Well, man, I'll tell you what, some of the things that used to be the, my pacifiers, you know what your pacifiers are? How many know what a pacifier is to a kid? We all have when the flesh gets hit, the flesh gets bumped. I feel insecure. I feel this. I feel that. So you run to your little pacifier the devil made for you. You know, there's a time, we did this with our kids, there's a time that the bobby's got to go. There's a time that pacifier's got to go. Because you're not called to pacify the flesh, you're called to crucify the flesh. And when I understand who he is, and I understand his covenant, I understand it's his kingdom, and I understand my call to servanthood, all the pacifiers have got to go, the security blankets have got to go. When I was a child, I act like a child, spoke like a child, thought like a child, but now that I've become a man, childish things have been put away. So what do you do when the devil discomforts you? I run to Jesus. What do you do when you feel insignificant? I get lost in his significance. What do you do when the whole world seems like they're against you? What do you do? I go to the feet of the one that the whole world was against him, but he said, you know what? Be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. I've learned to walk in that kingdom. And I mean, I've had to lighten my load. I've had to empty all my pockets. I've had to get rid of my Babylonian garments and my gold and my silver that came from Babylon. I'm not going to be an Achan in the city of God. I've learned to empty it all, and I've learned to take off the robes of an Egyptian slave, and I've learned to put on the robes of my master's house, the robes of righteousness. The Bible says the righteous acts of the saint are the robes of righteousness. I've learned. I want you guys just to bow your heads for a minute. I, I want you to just ask the question this morning. Who are you serving? Don't give me a religious answer. I'm not looking, oh, oh, of course, brother, I serve the Lord. I want you to look at your life. What, what does your life say 
that you're serving this morning? How much of self is there? How much of the world is there? You know, you can stop that in a heartbeat by saying, by acknowledging it, saying, Lord, this is where I've missed it. Right here. This is where I've missed it. I've discovered this is of self and not the kingdom. I've discovered this is of Egypt and not the kingdom. Lord, I've discovered this morning. I've marked it. I've, I'm confessing it. Yes, I did this. And I even, sometimes I did it thinking either I could get away with it or even convince myself somehow or another it was serving God's purpose. Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The devil told me that I had a right to do it. If, if you had been through what I had been through, then you'd be doing it too. That's a lie. Because we've all been through some different things, and the devil tries to implant lies to justify what we're doing. Lord, right now, I believe the angels are here handing us some nails and some hammers. Father, we're taking that thing that offends, that thing that is serving self or that thing that is serving darkness. And Father, right now, we nail it to the cross. Father, let the hammers be heard this morning in the spirit realm. Father, we say that we are sorry. We say that it was wrong. We say that we have believed lies of the enemy and we take those things this morning and we nail them to the cross and we say, die, be gone from us this morning in the name of Jesus. By his blood and by his name, be gone, we reject you. We will no longer look to you for comfort. We will no longer look to you for meaning. We will no longer look to you for anything but this day. We cast our eyes on the doorway of our master's house. Jesus, the word says that your sheep hear your voice and the voice of another they will not hear. Now, Father, I loose a salvation anointing for the soul in this place today. The word says to receive with meekness the engrafted word for the saving of our souls. And our problem is in many places in our souls is filled with Egypt. Father, route it out this morning. Let crucifixion take its place in this service this morning. Let nothing survive. That is not of you, Adonai. Jesus, come as the conquering king and conquer us from within. That your kingdom could be within, Lord. Every part, every piece, every chamber of our souls and of our flesh, Jesus, come as the high priest of our faith and sprinkle your blood. Sprinkle your blood and sanctify it. Let it be cleansed by your presence. Let it be cleansed by your blood. And let it be sealed by the anointing of your spirit this morning. Be jealous among us. And refuse anything within this temple to be of the enemy. Be as, the, as you did with the money changers of old. Knock over the tables. Drive it out this morning, Jesus. Because we're moving this morning toward being bond servants in the kingdom. No more hype. No more worrying about what's hip. No more of worldliness. But let it all be of Jesus. The Father, everything that we think and everything that we do, let it line up with Jesus. Let it line up with Jesus. Oh, Lord. Do your work in this place this morning. 
Do your work in this place. Let crucifixion take place right now. And Satan, right now I bind you over the hearts and minds of men. I bind you over the wounds. I bind you over the lies and say that you cannot enforce them anymore. Father, I believe that by your spirit, we are crucifying hurts. We are crucifying the flesh. And Father, we command the taskmasters of Egypt that we're enforcing those things. You're bound now. And I command you right now in the name of Jesus, you leave this person. You leave these hurts. You leave these false ideas. You leave the things that have been crucified never to go back again. I send you before God for judgment. And Holy Spirit, fill those places. Fill those places. No empty houses. No empty rooms. No locked doors to the God who can see all. But Jesus, come and cleanse and to fill. Set everything up to your liking. Throw out that which needs to be thrown out and bring in the items of the kingdom that you have predestined that are supposed to be there. Let true spiritual exchange take place. Throw out the old and let Jesus be put on in those places. My children, there has never been a time in the history of mankind that being a bondservant was more crucial. You're entering into a time I told you that it was going to be a tribulation like none the earth has ever seen. It would have never been before. It will never be since. You are beginning to approach those days. It is time to leave childhood behind and move on to adulthood. Because my bond servants will be sustained. My bond servants will be protected. Be my bond servant this morning. Choose maturity. Choose to press toward the mark of your high calling. Did not my servant Paul say that he considered everything else but dung, but just to know me? And to know the excellency of my kingdom. That's my call to you today. Is to press toward that mark of wholeness. With the goal of being my bondservant, you still have time. You still have some time, saith the Spirit of God, to prepare for what's coming. But yield to the preparation time. Because when the hammer comes down, it will be too late. There will be no extensions. There will be no, no time but, but saying, but Lord. But heaven will answer and say, I warned you. I told you to prepare. Heed my call, church. My beloved, heed my call. To learn of me, to learn of my ways and to be like me. It's your safety. It's your everything. Yes, Lord. Lord, with that prophetic unction, I believe that there was a prophetic anointing that's going to be like Jeremiah, to root up, to pull up, to tear down, to overthrow, and then to build. Let your presence, let your commandments, let your word be precious to us. Oh, Lord. This morning we just surrender all. 
everything. Everything, every room. Lord, nothing's hidden before you, Father. You know all the places that we try to hide from everybody. Jesus, invade those areas this morning. Please, Holy Spirit, invade those areas this morning. Mm -hmm. Let divine exchange take place. Oh. Thank you, Lord. Your spirit is so precious. The anointing is so precious. Surrender. Yes. Jesus, we just surrender this morning completely and wholly. Thank you, Lord. Now I'm going to close with a warning. How I many know oil just simply kind of gets all over everything and sticks there? The anointing that God's loosing in this place today is not going to be restricted just to this service. God's going to show you stuff tonight. God's going to show you stuff tomorrow. God's going to show you stuff the next day. God's going to bring up stuff so that you can crucify it, repent, cleanse it. It's going to be an ongoing process that started today. Yield to the preparation time. This is the beginning. I want you to be able to mark on your calendar the change started today. The healing started today. The coming out started today. You see, I want to have a coming out party. I'm coming out of Babylon. I want a party. I'm coming out of the pain of the past. I want a party. I'm going to praise him. Yes. I'm going to dance until I got to sit down because I'm in my 50s. And then I'm going to sit there and praise him still. Amen. Oh, Father. Father, I just place a seal of your spirit on what you've done today. And, Father, I put a post, I put a sign in the spirit realm that says, do not tamper with, do not move, do not touch kingdom of darkness. You'll not try to eradicate that which God started today. You will not hinder it. You will not prevent it. And, Father, I say woe to anyone or anything that tampers with that which God started this day because the king is beginning to judge. El Elyon is in the house. And he's beginning to judge so that the shackles can be broken and set free. Father, you finished your work. We look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We thank you and we praise you this morning for it. In Jesus' name.